what's going on you guys welcome back another episode of green lit gang tv uh appreciate you guys checking out the channel hope you guys are having a wonderful start to the week today we're going to be talking about luis king blood felipe um originator of the latin kings in new york um became a very very polarizing figure um not just for his activities in the in the you know in the latin kings but for the punishment he was eventually handed down for his um for his crimes that he committed so we're going to talk about a little bit about the latin kings give you a brief history on them and then we'll get into Luis Felipe and some of the things that ended up happening with him and his cases. Um, and guys, I really want to say this before we go into it any further. I really love feedback. I really love hearing what you guys have to say. I don't pretend to know everything. I'm not a know-it-all. If there's something that I'm I'm forgetting, if there's information you guys know that can add to this, leave a comment, please. You know, please leave a comment. I'll pin it. You know, if there's real information that I missed. I would. I love to hear about it. I, I try to absorb as much information as I can. I love these kinds of topics. I love discussing them with you guys. I love that I have a platform to, to put this stuff out. And uh, again, I just really appreciate you guys. So we're going to get into it here. The almighty Latin king and queen nation, one of the largest Caribbean and Latino street and prison gangs in the world, founded by Puerto Ricans in Chicago in 1954. The gang first started with founder Ramon Santos in the Humboldt Park area of Chicago. And that's right. You heard Queen Nation. Women were allowed into this gang. And, and not just saying allowed because there's other gangs that allow women in. But um, gangs either treat women way lesser than. They might not even allow them in. Or they're at a – it's just not at an equal level. And, and actually, you know, and please, again, this is one of the things. Please correct me. But this is one of the first videos I've done where women members – look to me to be equals uh, of the male members, you know? Um, so that's just something I found interesting and I thought it was pretty cool. I actually really liked that. So like I said, founded by Ramon Santos in the Humboldt Park area of Chicago, Illinois. And like a lot of these gangs in the early fifties and sixties, right? You hear about like the BMF, right? Uh, the black mafia family, right? Uh, where that was started in the California prison system, George Jackson, these guys started this to push back against discrimination and threats of violence and, and how they were being treated. And the Latin Kings were no different, all right? It was a Puerto Rican progressive movement with the goal of overcoming racial discrimination, okay? The Latino community was facing constant threats and acts of violence from Greek and Italian. They called them greaser gangs. If you've ever seen the movie Grease, right? They, what do they call them? The greasers and the, it's not jocks, but there's something else, Okay. And the Italian mafia, I didn't really know much about the, the Greek uh, mafia. That was kind of interesting to see that part of it. But the Italian mafia, this is 1954. They'd been running um, in America for the over half a century before this. And they were very well established. And they were, especially Chicago, New York areas, they were the ones, right? They were running the show. So Ramon Santos, this group of Puerto Ricans and other Latinos, they, they rise up together. They want rights. They don't want to be treated like crap anymore. They, they say, no, enough is enough. And, um, you know, he, he formed up with other Latino street gangs made up of Puerto Ricans and Hispanics to form what we now know today as the Latin Kings. Um, and the, the culture that was created in Chicago and Humboldt Park area is still there today. Um, but like a lot of well-intentioned prison gangs and street gangs that are start because, hey, we want rights. We want to be treated correctly. We don't want to be abused and we don't want to be uh, uh, treated less than human. It quickly turns into a criminal organization where drug sales, extortion, violence, it all comes into play because at the end of the day, it's about money and you need money to fund things. You need money for weapons. You need money to attract new members. You got to have something that people want to join. And I'm sorry, but being broke is not something people want to join. All right. And I'm sure there's more to it, but I'm just kind of giving you a quick outlier on it. Right. So, and side note, that movement in Chicago in that Humboldt Park area, that is still that is still very prevalent today. That still exists today. Um, two main factions, the King Motherland in Chicago and the Bloodline out of New York. Now, the Latin Kings are in almost 170 cities in over 30 states. And I did not know that Chicago has the most members with like I, I read. And I, again, I don't know how updated it is, but it was like twenty five to 30,000 members. And like myself, a lot of people associate the Latin Kings with New York. 
And a big part of that, at least for me, because the first thing I the first thing I ever watched about Latin Kings, Luis Felipe. And I encourage anybody, I've actually gotten a few good titles and a few of these videos I've done are on people that were featured in a, a very good show that came out in like the 2010 to 2012, 2013 area. It was called Gangsters, America's Most Evil. Um, it was on like the Biography Channel. And I think it was on A&E as well. Anyway... You guys need to check it out. I think Hulu or HBO Max has it or you can watch it. Please go watch those stories. They cover a wide range of topics, all different gangs, all different races. It's super cool, you guys. And if you guys like stuff like this, oh, my God, this is you would you guys would love it. Okay, you guys would absolutely love it. So enter King Blood, Luis Felipe. Right, who so many of us associate with the Latin Kings and why a lot of us know about the Latin Kings. And I'm just saying for myself, that's how I know about him because of this gentleman. All right. Luis Felipe, King Blood, was born in Havana, Cuba, May 6, 1962. Came to the USA on the Mariel boat lift in 1980. And if you know anything about the Mariel boat lift, it was basically where Cuba had loaded up these boats. And exactly what it sounds like it's a boat lift. Loaded up these boats with. All kinds of different people. I don't want to speak to, oh, they, they, they only, you know, like what Trump say in that one uh, speech he gave years ago where he says they're not sending their best. I don't know what Cuba sent, okay? I just know they sent a lot of people and they got it. They made it to Florida, okay? And in other states that were, you know, you know, I think Florida's only 90 miles off the coast of Cuba. So anyway, that's how he gets here. He had a hard life. He didn't come for much, all right? Ends up in Chicago. Not there very long. I think he's only there for like five to six years. And I really wanted to make sure I got this part right. He flees Chicago and goes to New York. And I, and I did get this right. He was basically the prime suspect. And ended up doing convicted of, of manslaughter over the murder of a woman in 1981. Okay. So gets to New York. Ends up getting picked up. Um, was always involved in crime from a, you know somewhat of a young age. Starts getting into trouble. Started his first large prison sentence for this manslaughter charge. He served a nine-year sentence in Collins Correctional Facility. Um, But it doesn't last terribly long in Collins Correctional Facility, right? Because by this time, he is the – basically, they call him the founder of the Latin Kings of New York. Now, again, I love feedback. If you guys know something I don't, weigh in. Please feel free to comment. I love reading them. I'll respond to them. I absolutely love love hearing from you guys. So – he takes the Latin Kings to the next level, okay? He makes them a very well-organized prison and street gang and was able to control everything from his prison cell. And I cannot emphasize this enough, but Luis Felipe was revered. He was loved by his people. Even if, you know, as we get into this in a little bit, his tactics were a little questionable. If you go on Vlad TV... There's an interview with a gentleman named King Tone, right, who was rose up through the ranks and was a high ranking member of the Latin Kings um, and has extreme love for Luis Felipe. And when Vlad talks to him about one point of the video, um, Vlad, if you know anything about Vlad TV, breaks his interviews down in parts. Well, in one point, um, Luis Felipe is kind of tears up. He gets emotional talking about the sentence that Luis Felipe was given for his crimes. Um, you know, he ended up doing 13 plus years behind it. So, um, it just gives you a sense of how Luis Felipe was looked. And this was from somebody that was a real leader of the Latin Kings and rose up through the ranks. Um, so Luis Felipe is controlling a lot of these movements and a lot of the day-to-day operations with letters he's writing to the outside world. Okay. In 93, that seems to be kind of the year that prison officials really realize the power that he's got and they realize he is the leader of the Latin Kings and that what he says goes. All right. Again, he's trying to control everything. He had attempted to send a copy of the Latin Kings manifesto through his mother as well as a message about it. And this is the important part, right? So not just a manifesto, but he sends something that he wants to be basically a, a hit, a person had fallen out of favor. Luis Felipe believed he'd betrayed the Latin Kings and needed to be dealt with accordingly. So that gets intercepted by the prison officials. All right. They read it. They go, oh, my God, this guy's got a lot of power. That, along with other things that were going on, he ends up getting transferred to Attica. Okay. Max security prison. 
All right. But he's still writing. He's still doing all his things. And I'll put up – you can see the pictures I put up in the video of his writings where he's, he's green lighting people to be, to be taken out. And eventually, you know, the, the prison officials, they read mail. They read – even if they're talking in code, even if they're you know, trying their best to hide it, it's going to get um, – it's going to get discovered. So eventually – we jump ahead about a year, right? He was arrested June 21st, 19, June 21st, 1994. It's an 18 count indictment. Other people were involved in it, but Luis King Blood Felipe is charged with seven racketeering charges involving murder and attempted murder um, of seven people. William Cartagena, Ismael Ramos, Rafael Gonzalez, Marjorie Cardoron, Ronnie Gonzalez, Pedro Rosario, and Victor Hirschman. All right, now, all of these range from members. One of them, you see Marjorie Cardone was a girlfriend of Rafael Gonzalez, okay? Or William Cartagena. Let me make sure I get this right. I don't want to say wrong information, all right? Yeah, William Cartagena. Marjorie Cardone was the girlfriend of William Cartagena. Um, and... They were all taken out basically because they had failed to commit orders. They were believed to be stealing money from the Latin Kings or undermining Luis Felipe's power. And what I gather from reading a lot of this stuff is he he basically was was you know he's locked up, right? People revere him, love him, but he's still locked up. So he ruled, in my opinion, with an iron fist. He was much. He had no sympathy. He did not give second chances. There was no, if, if you messed up, if you were believed to be a threat, he was going to take you out. And because and, I'm reading this, these guys, people, these people were members, right? And he had other members trying to assassinate these people. And he was successful in some and he wasn't successful in others. But the point is, a lot of violence takes place in a short amount of time. And... F- to be honest, prison officials and uh, authorities are pretty much able to tie this all back to him pretty pretty easily. You know, multiple witnesses, including two of his accomplices, one of the victim's girlfriends, police and forensic experts, and most importantly, Felipe Felipe's own words. There were over 60 letters he wrote at Attica that were intercepted, read, and it is... It, it, it just puts a nail in his own coffin, you know. And uh, on November 19th, 90, 1996, he was convicted on all counts. And on February 14th, 1997, Judge Martin sentenced to Felipe to life plus 45 years. Now, this is obviously that's a crazy sentence. But we have to read about the special confinement conditions because this is what a lot of people have talked about and where a lot of people are divided on what's right and what's wrong. And I really want to know your guys's, please, if there's nothing else to comment on, please comment on what you guys believe about these special conditions. All right. So judge Martin lays down special housing conditions, which means solitary confinement, no contact with other prisoners, no communicating with Latin Kings members, Latin King members, and only visits with his attorneys and family that was approved by the court. And and only phone calls to his attorney. All right? So basically, he got no human contact. And Luis Felipe was shaking his head the entire time, upset, um, saying that he told the judge, you're killing me every day by no contact, rules, no writing, no phone calls. He gets this sentence. And it is still written about today. He, he appealed. It was denied. He has had some restrictions loosened up over the years. Um, but it is a very harsh sense. It said, actually, that uh, prosecutors at the time were shocked, right? That they were obviously going for life and yada, yada. But he... The... <laughs> The, the length that they went to to get him and the punishment that came down, um, you know, is just, 
Just crazy. Uh, from what I read, he is still at ADX Florence, Colorado, which is a prison within a prison. Um, you know, like I said, some restrictions have been lifted, but that initial sentence was one of the most intense sentences that was ever handed down in a case like this. So, and this is what brought a lot of attention, you know, yes, his crimes brought attention, but it was the punishment and the extreme conditions that he was subjected to. Some people think it's torture. Some people think, Hey, it's just right. Um, there was a part in the courtroom where one of the mothers is screaming and crying at Luis Felipe. And basically saying how upset she is. And I miss my son. She's yelling. I miss my son. Why did you do that? I hope you, you know, suffer basically. And I'm, the reason I'm going to that is because, yes, he's suffering too. And like I said, he's a, in a prison within a prison. He's in a prison of his own mind. But you committed these horrible acts against these people and had people do things. You've got to pay for stuff like that. So anyway, there you have it. King Blood, Luis Felipe. Please give me your feedback. Again, I love talking to you guys. Appreciate you guys so much for checking out the channel. It's been growing. It means the world to me. Until we meet again.